Well, happy Easter. It's good seeing you. Thank you so much for being here this weekend. My name's Daniel. I'm senior pastor here, and it is a pleasure to welcome the Pastel community to Colorado Springs and to Mountain Springs this weekend. Just kidding. Y'all look spectacular. I'm just going to say it right now. If you have someone with wearing pastel around you right now, just tap them on the back and go, you look stunning. If it's your spouse, that's even better. If it's not, maybe it could lead somewhere. You never know. Anyway, you look great. Hey, I love Easter. I love Easter. We join with millions of people around the world every Easter where we're worshiping Jesus. We're worshiping the fact that he was victorious. He defeated the grave. He displaced sin. He created an opportunity for us to know him, know the Father through him. That is the reason of Easter. This is an incredible thing. 25 years ago, Personally speaking, 25 plus years ago was my Easter experience. It was an incredible time where I stood to give my heart and surrender my life to Jesus Christ. 25 plus years ago, here I am now, the honor and the opportunity to actually talk with people about what Jesus can do in their lives. Because here's what I love about Easter, beyond the lights and beyond those awesome, delicious Cadbury cream eggs is a Jesus Christ that loves us and loves us so much that he died for us. Talking about Cadbury cream eggs. Who likes Cadbury cream eggs? Those things are the bomb, aren't they? I don't know who Dr. Cadbury is, but he's doing the work of the Lord right there. I'm just saying, <laughs> it's a good work. I'm told that if you only eat the white, it's more healthy. So only eat the white, get a spoon and dig it out. I'm just saying, just kidding. Anyway, here's what I want to do this weekend. Because of the nature of Easter and Easter being the limitless love of Jesus Christ, what I want to do over the next 20 minutes is take you on a mini journey. I want to take us on a journey through the boldest paragraph in all of history. The boldest paragraph in all of history is found in Matthew 28 in the first seven or eight verses where we find on the heels of the death of Jesus, three days later, all of a sudden something dramatic happens. And here's what I want to do. I want to use... Matthew 28, the first eight or nine verses, to create a frame for us that within that frame, we can come up with three statements that are true about our lives as it relates to the opportunity to start over. Start over. There's many of us in this room this weekend that would love a do-over. There's many of us in this weekend that because of a relational breakdown or because of a financial situation or a health concern, that were like, hey, pick me, I would love a do-over. I had a woman come up to me earlier this morning after our first service of the day, the 7.30 service, and she came up and she said, when my son was four, he's now around 37 or so, when my son was four, I realized one day and I lifted him up to the Lord and I said, Lord, I have messed up this child. I have messed up this child and I basically need a do-over. I need to start over. There's many of us in this room right now that we were either the child that was lifted or we were the parent lifting the child and we would say, I need a do-over. I need a do-over. All of us remember the moment in our lives where life didn't turn out the way that we thought that it would. All of us remember the moment in our lives, that decision, that moment, unscrewing the bottle one more time, pouring that last drink, somehow taking those meds, those prescription meds, because we think it's helping us, but it's actually hurting us. All of us remember that one time in our lives where we walked out and slammed that door that last time and we knew that we'll never be that same person again. But, oh, if we could only take back some of what we said. We all remember that moment. We've all made decisions that we regret. We all have a storyline of our life that's parts of it that we don't like the chapter or the paragraph or the phrase, and we wish we could do it all over. So I want to share with you from the text of Matthew 28 how I believe we get a do-over, how we get a start-over. Verse 1 says this. Now, after the Sabbath, if you have the app downloaded, you can follow along. If you want to, you can go to the app store and you can download the app. If you have a Bible, you can follow along also. Matthew 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath... Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, by the way, can you imagine being called the other Mary, like the loser Mary? The other Mary went to see the grave, the grave. Let me tell you what a grave is, and you all know this. Maybe some of you in this past year have actually lost a loved one. You know what a grave is. You know the tears and the emotion and the regret and the closing of a chapter and all of the re- just emotions that come together with the grave. Well, in this moment, as they walk towards the grave three days after the beating And really all that what happened with Jesus, he was hung upon the cross and he was died and placed upon that grave. In many ways, it represented the end of a dream. The end of a dream. It was a failed dream. All of their life choices and all of their life dreams lay tattered around the floor of the cross and they put him into the cave and they're like, it's over. Well, as they walk to the grave, they realize life will never be the same way again. So they thought. There's not one of us in this room right now that in one part of our lives, it feels like when we walk towards that situation, our marriage, whether we walk towards that situation, our health, that we feel like we're walking towards something where Jesus is dead. He's not alive. 
He seems absent. He seems disconnected from the reality. Perhaps even here right now, you're in a separation agreement with your spouse. There's a terrible situation going on. You look back and there's some fault of your own, but there's a lot of fault on the other side too. And you're just like, man, if only it could have been different. I'm not sure it can ever be repaired. We have that moment. We have that moment. Perhaps some of you are going through wranglings with your ex right now. I had a guy come up to us earlier at the second service of this morning. Incredible story. Cowboy guy with awesome boots and a sweet buckle. It was awesome. He came up, surrendered his heart to Jesus Christ, received Jesus for the first time, was getting baptized, coming out of the baptism tank. He said, on Monday, on Monday, I had the papers drawn up and I was going to file for divorce. But now I know God has got a plan. I need to do something different. I need to humble myself. I need to change my life. And I need to fight for that marriage. Come on. That's good, not just because of sweet cowboy boots. That's good because of the story of God's redemption. No matter your story, no matter how far you've gone in the wrong direction, I believe that, yes, point one, the realization of loss and that we have a grave, point one being that there is that realization of loss in our lives. You can, no matter how long you've walked in the wrong direction, stop, turn around, and go back. That's true for the Monday morning filing of the divorce papers. That's true for every situation. It might sound cliche, but you can't fix it on your own. You can't fix it by meeting your physical needs, by meeting your financial goals, by meeting your planning in the future. You can't fulfill and change the realization of the grave in your life until you come to a point of saying, I can't fix this, but I need Jesus too. And again, it might sound cliche, but I believe, I really believe this, that in the same way that 25, 26 years ago in my life, This weekend, God can change the direction of your life for all of eternity. You can make a decision that not only shapes your eternity, it will shape the eternity of your kids and your kids to come. It is the power of God. But there is that realization. There's not one of us in this room that can go through life and not be stung by the harsh effects of the fallen nature of the world. Whether in marriage, family, and we live in this selfie-centered, we all position ourselves under the right lighting and filter, and we capture the picture of ourselves because we want to portray that everything is okay, but everything is not okay. Everything is not okay. And one of the downsides of social media is what it's done is it's create this veneer of everything is awesome. Everything is not awesome. <laughs> it's not. And there's pain, and there's a reality of that, and we need to realize it in the grave. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. No matter what your story is, it is not the end of your story. It is not the end of your story. And I love what verse 2 says in Matthew 28. Mary and the other Mary were walking to the grave. They were trying to close a chapter. It's what you do when you go to the graveside. Try to bring closure. Get beyond the shock to start seeing the waves of grief and the cycles of grief. Mary's there and she's looking and she's waiting and she's wondering. And then look at this. The ground starts to shake. Maybe in your life right now, the, sh- the, the shaking of your life is such to where you're barely holding on. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven. He came and he rolled back the stone, the stone that was blocking the entrance to the tomb where Jesus' body was laying. He rolls back the stone and then the text says he sits on it. Like he treats it like a garden base, like, yo, what's up? He just kicks back. He rolls the stone away. You're like, what kind of stone? Was it a pebble he could kick? No, 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 two tons. He rolls it away. The tomb is open. His appearance was like lightning. His clothing was white as snow. And for the fear of him, the gods trembled and became like dead men. Point two, point two, the breakthrough. For every realization of our grave, whatever it might be, whatever it's cost you, no matter how far it's taken you, No matter how long you've been there, the realization of the grave, for every grave, we need a breakthrough. We need a breakthrough. We can't roll the stone away from the entrance to our life. We can't roll away or roll in a better marriage. We can't roll in a better parenting situation. All we can do is say, God, we need a breakthrough. We need a breakthrough in this realization of the grave. Here's the problem with pain. There's two primary problems with pain. Number one, sometimes pain in our lives can feel so big and so immovable that we believe it to be true about our lives that it will define who we are. In our moment of darkness, in our dark night of the soul, we look inside of our heart, we see a darkness that we don't like, and if we're not careful, the pain feels so big and so immovable, we cannot push it out of the way of the entrance of our lives that we allow it to start defining who we are. For example, I was broken, therefore I am broken. 
I was abused when I was a child, therefore I will be an abuser if I'm not careful. I can't get free from that. I had a woman come up to me yesterday, a beautiful young woman came up. And she goes, when I was seven years old, I was abused by my father. I've struggled for years now because of the sexual identity that was broken in that situation. And in that time, that pain became so immovable that I couldn't move it from my life. Finally, I came to a point seven Easter's ago when I said, I've had enough. Instead of trying to end my life, I tried to begin my life. And she began her life with Jesus Christ. Come on, that's so good. So good. And she stood in front of me and I was like, man, there is something that God has done in your life. There is this beauty that God has done in your life. Why? She realized she couldn't do it on her own. And she realized that the pain was immovable. But she said, I'm no longer going to be defined by the story that's happened to me. I'm going to be defined by his story that's gone before me. And I'll tell you, when we can live in that way, when we can live in that way and not let the pain afflicted to us shape us, all of a sudden we change. The other thing about pain is this. Sometimes fear and failure and regret can feel so permanent, though it's temporary, it can feel so permanent that all we ever think of is all I am, all that I have experienced is all that I'll ever be. For example, our kids are not in a good place. My kids will never be in a good place. My marriage is going through a bad chapter. Our marriage will always be bad. And if we're not careful, we can allow the temporary things of our lives to become permanent in the way we live. Let me say something this weekend. If you catch one thing, catch this one thing. Something doesn't have to be true in our lives to have power over us. It just has to be believed by us. Something doesn't have to be true. Yes, you might have gone through a painful situation, an episode, a season, abuse of some form. But though there is a truth that God is wanting to reveal, sometimes we give power by placing belief in a lie. Here's what we do. We go through and we start to write labels that we believe to be true for our lives. I'm abused. I'm broken. I'm nothing. I'm an alcoholic. And we stick them with these self-adhesive labels all over our bodies and we allow the labels to define our lives. Here's the problem. Labels are lies. Labels are lies. Your feelings will lie to you and your labels will affirm and reaffirm what you fear most about your life. But we put these labels over our lives. Again, let me say it this way. It doesn't have to be true to have power. It just has to be believed. What can we do this weekend to break the power of the lie and the label in our lives? Because we will never experience all that God has designed for us if we live under the weight of the label. I love this quote. It says, resurrection means that the worst thing is never the last thing. Let me read it to you again. Resurrection means that the worst thing in your life is not the last thing in your life. Something better is coming. There is no problem too big. There is no pain so permanent. There is no enemy so powerful that he can limit or hamstring the work that God wants to do through bringing a breakthrough into your life. Verse 5, the angel said to the woman, Don't be afraid. For I know that you think Jesus who is here, who is crucified, but he is not here. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where he was laying. In this moment, Jesus dealt a death blow to the heart of the enemy. He dealt a death blow. He trampled on the head of the enemy. And he said, we're not going to permit and allow that anymore. And in that moment, in Jesus defeating the grave, what he did was he stepped back and he danced upon the injustice of our lives and he declared liberty for every captive, for every person, for every person that says there is no freedom. You know what I love about Easter? I call it Freedom Day. It's Freedom Day. There is a freedom possible in our lives now. And the resurrection proves that everything that Jesus said is true, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Christianity is not ideas, ideals, or waxing philosophical. That's not Christianity. Christianity is one man, one cross, and one freaking empty tomb. That is Christianity. That is Christianity, and I love it, and we need it more in our lives. You can leave here this weekend. Yes, you've got the realization of the grave, but because of the breakthrough of Jesus Christ, you can leave here this weekend an entirely new creation. Not a better version, not a better dressed version, not a more articulate version, not a I've got hair, I haven't got hair version, not a better tweaked version. You can leave here a whole new creation. I love what it says in Corinthians. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he is transformed into a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Come on. We need that. We need the new of Jesus Christ. So it might sound cliche, 
It might sound cliche, and I know this to be true because I've spoken many times to many people in many places of pain. It might sound cliche to you, and you're probably thinking, Jesus, blah, 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 Jesus, blah, blah, blah. Get me some eggs. Get me brunch. Get me breakfast at Village Inn. No, no not Village Inn. Get me breakfast. <laughs> You might be thinking that right now. Can I tell you right now, what I'm inviting you into is not a one-time decision that you forget on Wednesday. I'm asking you to be gut-level honest with yourself and answer the question, do you like living in the realization of your grave? Do you like the way you wake up every day? Do you like the pain that you feel? Do you like the hatred that you hold towards your ex? Do you like the hatred that you hold towards your current spouse, but yet you're not living together? Do you like that, or do you get finally sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you go, man, I need something? Here's what you need. Point three, the relationship. The relationship. We need the relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at this, verse 7. Go quickly. Tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. And behold, verse 9, boldest line of the boldest paragraph ever, Jesus met them. He came up. They took a hold of him of his feet. They worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Can I tell you one of the things right now that you need to hear this weekend? Is the first thing that Jesus wants to speak over your life, the moment you step outside of the grave of fear, is do not fear. Do not fear. You know what? You want to know what cripples your life more than anything? It's the fear of the unknown. That's the reason we have faith, belief in what we do not see. Fear is concerned based upon what we do see. First thing Jesus says is don't fear. Why? They're like, dude, you just came back from the dead. I'm kind of freaking out right now. Jesus walks up. It's like, okay, don't fear. You know the reason Jesus walked out? is so that we can walk out. The reason Jesus got up and woke up on that third day and walked out of that tomb is the same thing. He turns around and he goes, come on, come on, let's all leave. Let's leave this place of death. You can leave the place of death this weekend. We can leave this place. He says, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, go to Galilee there. They will also see me. Point three. Point three the relationship. At every juncture of life, at every place of life, at every episode and crisis and situation in life, Jesus walks just like that right up to us and he goes, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And in the place of our realization of the grave, we experience a breakthrough through Jesus Christ. And the breakthrough of Jesus Christ displaces the realization of the grave with a revelation, with a relationship of love and of grace. He walks up to us. He approaches us. It doesn't matter how long you've walked in one direction. It doesn't matter what choices you've made. Your life is no longer going to be defined by your story. Your story describes what you have done, but it will not and should not define the person that you can become. That's defined by Jesus. That's defined by Jesus. You go, man, I'm just not worthy. I had a guy come up to me last night. He goes, dude, I'm so broken. I'm so messed up. I'm so busted. He goes, I just got remarried, but this is my situation. I've done things that no one should have ever have done. I've violated my values. I've violated other people's values. I've absolutely violated my conscience. I've done everything. He goes, I'm not worthy for this. And I said, good news, brother, nor am I. Here's the good news of Easter. The Easter story is this, that in the place of us not being worthy, Jesus, who was worthy, came and displaced our sin and said, now come to the Father through me. We are not worthy until Jesus declares over us we are worthy. Jesus is the one that peels off the labels of our lives, and he is the one that then closes with righteousness and said, come on, you're a son and daughter of the house now. And I love that to be true about Easter. Don't stand. Okay, okay. Stop trying. We'll go get some. Don't live another moment of life branded by a lie. Don't take another breath. I was in San Diego earlier this week, and I drove past one of the bridges. And on every bridge, and certainly the Coronado Bridge, we dropped over in the Coronado for a few days for spring break, and I was so prompt to share this right now. I haven't shared this in any other service. As I was driving across the Coronado Bridge, I feel emotion welling up in me, so maybe this is the Lord, or maybe I've just gone way off track. There's a sign there in the middle of the Coronado Bridge, and it's the suicide hotline. And it says, call this number. I really feel like right now there's some people in this room right now that you've been wrestling with the value of your life, and the number that you need to call is 316. You need to call out to God the Father who says, I sent my son Jesus not to condemn you, but to save you. I just feel it in this room right now that there is this sense of aimlessness in life. 
purposelessness in life and you're saying what is it and I just feel, believe that there is a bridge and I'm telling you right now and I don't want to stretch this metaphor too far because every metaphor breaks down at some point but there is a bridge and you are crossing the bridge and the suicide hotline is Jesus Christ because he has created a bridge for you from life from death into life and if you're here right now and you're like man I need to do something here in a few moments we're going to give you an opportunity to respond but here's what I want to tell you the realization of the grave the breakthrough of Jesus Christ and the relationship of grace there's one thing, if I could sum up everything that I'm trying to say right now, there's one thing. Don't let anything stop you from getting it right with God. Whether you're, in your, you're upstairs in the venue, you're online right now, you're in this space right now, don't let anything stop you from getting right with God. It doesn't matter your story. It doesn't matter how long you've walked in the one direction. You can stop and turn around. It doesn't matter how you've allowed your story to define you. You can stop that story and you can write a new story. No matter what you've done, we've all made bad decisions. We've all made decisions that we regret. We've made decisions that cost us more than we want to pay. But this Easter, I believe there is a calling out to God. Dial the number of God and say, God, I'm not doing so great. Maybe right now, I believe there's even people in this room right now, and you've walked with God for many years, but you'd say, not only is this a dry patch, this is a desert spell. This is desert land. It's nothing, there's no life. I'm barely keeping it together for my kids that look to me for some hope in their life. I'm telling you right now, don't miss a moment this Easter to make it right with God. Make it right with Jesus. And you go, I'm not worthy. You don't have to be. Jesus says you are worthy. Forgiveness changes everything. Forgiveness not only empowers you to forgive others, forgiveness, don't miss this, empowers you to forgive you. Forgive yourself. Some of the things you've done, said, thought, who you've been with, where you went, forgive yourself. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to sing a song. Rachel's going to sing some lyrics over us. I invite you to sing along. But if you'd prefer, let Rachel sing those lyrics over you. But here's my thing. See this as a momentary palate cleanser between that and what I'm going to do when I come back. When I come back, I'm going to create an opportunity for us to respond. To respond to this message of hope that is the limitless love of God. Let's sing this song together.
Today can be that day. Today can be that day when you step away. You step away from your pain. You step away from your regret. You step away from that story. I want to invite you to make a decision in a moment, but not a decision you'll forget on Wednesday, but a decision that you'll remember for the remainder of your life. I'm going to ask three questions here in a moment. First one is going to be around first-time commitment to Christ. Second is going to be a re-upping to Christ. Incidentally, I'm going to raise my hand on the second question, a re-upping with God. And then the third one is going to be about baptism, but first this. If you're in this room right now, you're in the venue upstairs, you're online right now, and God has been knocking on the door of your heart. You're not sure if you feel nauseous or what's going on right now, but God has got a hold of you somehow. God has got a hold of you somehow. 25 plus years ago when I surrendered my heart to Christ, I felt like my heart was beating out of my chest. And there was a moment where it was actually being put into my chest, a new heart. And it changed me. If you want a new heart, and you would say for the first time, I need to surrender my heart to Jesus Christ right now. I want you to raise your hand boldly right now. Raise your hand with me right now. Come on. That's right. Come on. His hand's going up everywhere, and I'm blind as a bat. This is awesome. Come on. This is so good. So good. Upstairs. Upstairs, if you're in the alternate venue right now, keep your hands up in the air right now. If you're in the venue right now and you want to raise your hand, trust me, there are people up there that want to pray with you, talk with you. Anyone upstairs? Here's the other thing I want to do. How many of you in the room right now, there are people, by the way, upstairs that are raising their hands right now. You think, man, is this preacher talk? How does he know this? There's a light flashing over here. It tells me there's people upstairs right now with their hands raised. Can we just say good job to those upstairs right now? Come on. Come on. Second thing is this. You're here right now, and like me, like me, maybe it's been a long while, or maybe you feel like you've been going through a desert place. You love the Lord. You've surrendered your heart to Him, but you feel like in many ways you're excluding Him or at least trying to from much of life. And you'd say, like me right now, I want to re-up. I want to re-surrender my heart to Christ. Would you raise your hand with me right now if that's you? Come on. Some people with two hands in the air. I love that. Come on. All in, baby. All in. Love it. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much. Just lower our hands. Jesus, for every hand that was raised, first time commitment to Christ, a re-upping with Christ. Lord, in this space, upstairs in the venue, online at home right now. Father, we thank you what you're doing in and through this weekend, the ministry of grace to displace the grave with a new grace of relationship. We bless you, God, in your name. Amen. Here's what we're going to do now.